Um, okay, so now it's time for our panel discussion. Okay, so uh, if I invite our lovely panelists to join me up here. So we are going to be joined by um, our keynote speakers. We'll have Andre and Fungai joining us. Uh, so if you can make your way up. We'll also be joined by Michael Gaffey. Okay, I won't do the introduction again because I'll get told off. Okay, uh, come on up. Um, just a, 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 leave this seat for me. And then we're also uh, joined, uh, it's a great pleasure to say that Eric uh, Agudello, who is the founder of Play, Learn, Develop, and has also participated in various HIV related events such as The Living Project, How to Tell a Secret, and the Pause Vibe podcast. Eric also volunteers with M Power. Uh, and then, um, and then also, um, one of my favorite, favorite um, panelists to interview, and I think I've done, I don't know how many times I've interviewed Robbie at this stage, a number of times in this very event. Uh, so Robbie uh, Lawler became active within the HIV community since his diagnosis in 2012. Robbie is a member of the European AIDS Treatment Group and is a co-founder of Access to Medicines Island. Robbie is currently um, doing a PhD. I didn't realize that. You're a PhD candidate uh, at Dublin City University and has a particular interest in grassroots activism and the access to medicine movement in Eastern Europe. I look forward to ca calling you Dr. Robbie Lawler very soon. Okay. Oh, there's no seat for me. Okay, never mind. Right. Right, fair enough. <laughs> okay. I, um, oh, yeah, there's a seat. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. It's just so much better, you know? Yeah. Apologies, apologies. Oh my God, oh God. This is all very seamless, isn't it? Very seamless. Okay, so um, Michael, if I can go to you first. Um, how do you consider Ireland's recently announced pledge to the Global Fund to fight uh, AIDS, tuberculosis, and uh, malaria with an increase of 30%? I know that Minister Brophy uh, actually mentioned that in his opening speech. Will serve to achieve progress against uh, the um, SDG3, particularly in relation to HIV and AIDS, Michael. Okay, well, the first thing to say is that progress on the SDGs is not going in the right direction. Mm -hmm. None of the SDGs is going in the right direction, mm -hmm. and that includes health, and it includes, in particular, the targets uh, on, on, on HIV. So, I mean, I think we'll be saying this over and over again. We are living at a time of multiple intersecting crises. And uh, they, uh, the real danger is that, in our work, we will focus only on one to the detriment of others. But the calls on uh, the, 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 the funds available for humanitarian and development work, the calls on it are massive. You know, in 2015, when we agreed the goals, we were very optimistic. The important thing now is not to be pessimistic in the face of mm. multiple challenges. Because, and I'll come to your question, but because, but, but because the, 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 the real point is, we are in a different situation. We know, how to, uh, we know how to address these challenges. When it comes to HIV and AIDS, we know what to do. We have the means, we have the technologies, we have just to find, frankly, the political will. And so that actually is what I would be very proud of this year, is that Ireland managed to find that political will. To be honest, we don't always find the political will, but we did find it this year. And when we went to the UN in September, we were able to speak about food security in a time of crisis, but also global health in a time of crisis. And, and we were, frankly, one of the few countries that found the 30% increase that was asked for by the Global Fund and, and, and pledged it. I'm not going to say who did and who didn't, but I can be proud that we, that we did. Oh, go on, and go it, on. Is absolutely, it is absolutely vital if we are to start reversing, if we are to start making progress again. Uh, the Global Fund is a fantastic organization Ireland, both in terms of government and civil society, have been strong, strong supporters since its foundation. And we need the Global Fund. It's flexibility. We saw it, we heard from Andrea, it's flexibility in Ukraine. What they have managed to do in Ukraine is incredible. So I think our funding, at a time of crisis in Ukraine, crisis in the Horn of Africa, I came back this morning from Ethiopia, at a real time of crisis, an organization that is flexible and effective, like the Global Fund, is actually what we need more of. Great. Because the, the term person-centered has been used by every speaker. 
uh, how we need a person-centered approach, and, uh, and that's exactly what the flexibility is all about. You know, what, what, what does the person in front of me need right now? You know? um, Robbie, so bringing things back to Ireland, uh, I, I know uh, uh, that you recently uh, took part in a tour around Ireland, um, and, this, and, and this was to see students' reactions to learning more about HIV and what needs to be done. Uh, Robbie, how was that tour? Where did you go? It was great. It just finished today. Well, I wouldn't say finished. I think it just started today, truly. Um, so I've done a speaker tour, and I, actually with great help from the Irish Global Health Network um, and the student outreach team, who are absolutely brilliant on Oxfam, Ireland. So uh, myself, uh, Fernando Sangali from Kenya, and Mirza Pertilio from Costa Rica, went around to ask the question, are we prepared for the next pandemic? The answer is obviously no, right? So we're given case studies from HIV, monkeypox, COVID-19, and antimicrobial resistance. And um, so we're all doing PhDs in the area, we're all experts, and I, I live with HIV. So we got to go around to over 120 students who are medical students, public health students, global health students, microbiologists, um, law students. And we got to ask these real questions and really give a true to form of story. It wasn't a lecture. I get to say to all these students, why is it that I'm on my sixth option of HIV treatment and I could go on my seventh or eighth if I needed to? But people around the world don't have the same access, especially in lower middle-income countries. Do you know that between 9 to 12 million people died in Sub-Saharan Africa alone between 1996 and 2006 because gen uh, generic cheaper drugs were not allowed to be uh, made, bought or sold in Sub-Saharan Africa? And AIDS is a horrible way to die. And it's just purity for greed. They died. So for COVID-19, you think, OK, we may have done better. Have we learned from past mistakes? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. The Moderna vaccine, $10 billion of taxpayers' money, public money, went into the research and development of that vaccine and in um, uh, contracts, right? So it's basically completely de uh, de-risked the whole thing. That should have been a public vaccine. But no, Moderna got all the intellectual property or the majority of intellectual property, wouldn't share the recipe. So Angali said his grandmother wasn't given one vaccine and in Ireland he was being offered his tour and she died. In 2007, his auntie died of AIDS. Then we got into monkeypox, and this really boils my blood. It should boil everyone's blood here. I have friends who got monkeypox, and let me tell you how agonized they were. I had a friend who had to isolate for 40 days. 40 days. And we weren't given the same benefits that you were on the COVID-19 illness benefit. Two public health emergency of international concern, but we were treated differently. And it's agonizing. You had ulcers in your penis all up your rectum. I had a friend in the UK who had to go to the hospital because I was, he couldn't even swallow his throat was so full. How many monkeypox vaccines do you think has been sent to Nigeria or Congo? Zero. You're right. I have two monkeypox vaccines. The majority of deaths of monkeypox is found in Nigeria and Congo, which where has been endemic for the last 50 years. I won't even get too much into the fact that we already had diagnostics, we already had treatment for monkeypox, we already had vaccines. Oops, sorry, it wasn't me. <laughs> <laughs> Eric. Dramatic effect. <laughs> Dramatic effect. I think it just adds to my anger. Um, we already had diagnostics, we already had treatment, tecoviramat. We already had vaccines and we still failed. We still failed. It is now endemic in America. It's going to spread indefinitely, albeit at lower levels. And then antimicrobial resistance. We haven't got one new class of antibiotics since the 80s. Not one. Because we're not putting the money into the research and development. And it's risky research. So pharma companies are backing out of it because they don't see it as profitable. The majority of big pharma have left the antibiotic uh, um, uh, preclinical research and development. One million people die of AMR around the world every year. If we continue on as we are, it's going to go up to 10 million by 2050. And still, there's very little research going into it. So now that I uh, angered you all enough, I like to say there is a solution. So um, we went to go into these students, and we said there are ongoing negotiations for a pandemic treaty happening at this time. 
after the shit show that was the COVID-19 pandemic and our lack of global solidarity, the World Health Organization came together and said, we need a pandemic treaty. That's legally binding. And the first draft came out. And actually, it's a good draft. It's, we invest more in um, diseases that are endemic in countries such as Sub-Saharan Africa, Latin America, Southeast Asia, invest in them because they may become, like Ebola, like monkeypox, uh, pandemic threats. Invest in them. But when we put more money into them, let's have conditions on that. If we put funding into it from public taxpayers' money, well, then it's a public vaccine. We share the recipe with the world. We don't have this crap situation again where I have access to all the treatments, but my friends and family all die of AIDS in the early 2000s. So um, today I ended the speaker tour, or started, in the doll. We brought students from all over Ireland to the doll, uh, including Aidan, and we have Sarah here, two amazing young people. And um, to say to TDs, Ireland's voice needs to be strong for equity, human rights, and dignity in this treaty, uh, pandemic treaty. And don't water it down like you do with the COVID-19 trips waiver, which is a huge shame. I welcome Minister Brophy's comments that we need transformation and no longer business as usual, because if we're going to have any cop on and we're expecting more and more pandemics because of the climate crisis, we've got to get a handle on this. So I'm excited. TDs are really, really good. We're going to get it into the Health Directors Committee. We're going to get it on the political agenda, because this farce cannot happen time and time again. Wow. Thank you. Woo. I, I'm going to call you already, Dr. Rob, Robbie Dollar. <laughs> Thank you. I think you definitely um, earned that title already, Robbie. Uh, Eric, Eric. Um, so thank you for the dramatic effect there for <laughs> Robbie's, uh, Robbie's uh, um, um, answer there. But uh, Eric, could you tell us a little bit about your story? Because you, you particularly have an experience of, um, of seeking asylum in, in Ireland um, based on being HIV positive. Could you tell us a bit more about that? And thank you, thank you very much for sharing your story because it takes great courage. Sure, thank you. And before I answer the question, I'll do like Michael as well. Michael Rice, uh, your name, sorry. Michael, Michael, yeah. I thought it was Michael. I'm terrible with names. But I'll just talk about something else and then I'll get to the question. But <laughs> uh, I'll, do something, I'll do something today that I haven't done, I think never, uh, which is like, quite literally say thank you to the government of Ireland and the Irish people for welcoming in this country. And the reason I never said it is possibly because never spoke publicly until maybe 18 months ago when I started doing this. And I didn't do it because the stigma and the shame of being HIV positive. So um, I was not talking about being a refugee because that leads to talk about being positive. And um, so, Getting there to the, the questions. <laughs> uh, I became positive about 23, 24 years ago. I must have been 19, 20. Um, can't really remember. I came to Ireland about 21, 22 years ago. Uh, back then, HIV and you know, medication and all of that was a bit uh, different. Mm -hmm. You know, the U, it was U didn't exist. So uh, we have come a long way and when I hear young people talk about HIV, I don't want to sound like a friend of mine. I have this friend of mine, doesn't live in Ireland anymore, but we used to call him mother. And not so much because he was the oldest in the, in the group, but because he knew best. You couldn't tell him anything and he would say, I've done it. You know, like if you say, oh, I'm gonna do drag on Friday. I've done that in the 60s when it was illegal. You know? I think we all have a friend like that, don't we? <laughs> so when, um, one, one thing about when I started talking about being um, positive, which is only recently, I made a couple of decisions with my life, and one of them is to look at the good side rather than the past and the horrible things that have, have happened and continue to happen in other parts of the world. But I mean, thankfully, I'm now Irish, European, and I live in Europe, so I want to look at the, the good side. And when I hear young people talk about HIV, it's a complete different speech. It's different than when we talk. I became positive during the end of the 1990s and early 2000s. I was born in Venezuela. That's when that happened as well. So what we consider the peak of the epidemic in, say, for example, the States and um, Europe, it had a bit of a delay going to, say, for example, South America. And that's when I got it. And 
again, I don't want to focus on the negatives, I prefer to focus on the positives. So coming to Ireland uh, was the best thing that happened to me. Um, I got access to medication right away. My first ever health screen uh, screen was done in, in Ireland. Um, when I was fearing that I might have contracted HIV, um, living in Venezuela, I was again 19, 20, something like that. It took me about five months to find a clinic to get uh, tested. And I only got tested because after finding a private clinic that was charging X amount of money, I had to bribe the doctor to uh, do the test. So that's how difficult it was uh, to get tested. And uh, Venezuela at the time was going through a process. It was the early start of the Chavez coming into power and all of this ideology and whatever that resulted in, in Venezuela. Um, and it got much worse. And I made a decision. People around me died of HIV-related uh, illnesses. And um, much like myself here, not talking about HIV, well, worse because in Venezuela, like other places, call them what you may, underdeveloped, developing third world countries, whatever. It's worse because there's no medication, there's no access to healthcare. The stigma is, is worse, the um, misinformation, the fear is most, much worse, and um, the lack of access to testing, as I mentioned, and medicine. And uh, as a result of all of these, and the crisis that was developing in Venezuela at the time, the health system was collapsing, and I made a decision that, well, I was, that was not going to happen to me. You know, I was not going to accept dying in Venezuela in some corner in a hospital because of a disease, beg your pardon, and uh, infection mm -hmm. that can be easily uh, treated with a pill that can be taken just once a day. When I started taking my medication, uh, we had come into the one pill a day. Um, before that, it used to be three or more, and um, yeah, so in a nutshell, I guess that's my story. <laughs> thank you, Eric. Uh, thank you for sharing your story. It takes Im immense courage to do so, but also it just, it really sheds a kind of, uh, a different light when you look at the asylum seeking process. You know, just you, you sharing that story actually goes, you know, actually there's some good things, you know, the good things that, that uh, this process has, has brought. You, you, you brought us you to Ireland, so yeah. yeah. I've always had people say that Ireland is better for, for someone like me to, to be here, but Ireland is better for someone like you to be here, so. Don't ask my boyfriend that question. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, if you, if you cook, cooked him dinner or took out the wheelie bins, maybe he might say yes, yes. you know, good, good, okay. Yeah, everybody has the domestic issues, not to worry. Um, okay, um, so. So, uh, moving to uh, Andre, um, I, I want to ask you around st stigma and self-stigma and war. You know, what, what the relationship of of the of the three? Because you did you did say that people who are vulnerable just become more vulnerable uh, in a, in a time of war. But I suppose how how do they perceive their own um, their own status around being HIV positive? This is a very important question because uh, in the time of the war, uh, all these vulner vulnerabilities just increasing. Uh, and uh, for people living with HIV, uh, there is a fear that uh, uh, being on occupied territories, they will be not only left without medicines, as it happened in many occasions, but will be uh, uh, badly treated, uh, and uh, we had several examples of this, uh, which are very, very worrying. Uh, it's important at the same time uh, that uh, the activist movement, which was cultivated in Ukraine for so many years, now actually helped, and some people, rather with dignity, saying, uh, we need these services. War doesn't mean conservation of the medical treatment. It doesn't mean conservation to access for prevention services. Mm -hmm. And it works. In my town, in Lviv, where I am at the moment, uh, number of clients on PrEP increased seven times because of the move of the people. 
And it's so critically important to, to address this need. Uh, or, well, with trans people who moved uh, and lost connection sometimes with a friendly doctor or with a uh, lack in treatment, uh, it's so critical to, to renew it. And I also would like to highlight, I actually brought this uh, report, I didn't know about this question, but UNAIDS issued a report, uh, it's called In Danger. About half a year ago, it was presented at the AIDS uh, uh, conference in Montreal. And uh, one, one thing I'm particularly concerned, and I think everyone, is the uh, uh, risk of HIV acquisition uh, is, uh, for example, 35 times higher for people who use drugs than for average uh, adult, or uh, 30 times higher for female sex workers, uh, 28 times higher for gay men. What are we doing with this information? It's uh, so shocking, and uh, these reports are not created to be, you know, on shelves or even to be quoted nicely in some PowerPoint presentations. This is the call for action, and I think this is a reminder for all of us that even in a normal times, this is not about the war. Uh, this is huge uh, inequality, in, uh, a huge risk uh, uh, in regard to vulnerabilities and risks. So we need to do something about this. So for me, it's a reminder if we know something, it's also responsibility. It's not for, for okay, noted. So it's a responsibility for action. And in the time of the war, we act. And uh, it's also a lesson. We need to act and act quickly. Thank you. Thank you, Andre. And, and moving on to Fungai, I, my, my question is, it's about self-stigma, but in relation to women and girls, because it's the area that you, that you really focus on. Because you know, women and, and girls are you know, con conditioned to be caregivers, you know? It's all about caring about everybody else. It's like, as a mother, I know this, you know? <laughs> Everyone's needs are met, and I literally think of myself the last two minutes before I leave the house going, where's my this, where's everything? But I suppose in, in relation to self-stigma, self you know, uh, from a cultural perspective, um, how, how can you, uh, how are you working with the girls and women to really shift that from um, caring ab about others, but actually shifting it to self-care and care putting the, the woman and the girls' needs first, which is so culturally, uh, you know, just <laughs> almost impossible sometimes. Culturally impossible is accurate. Um, most of the women and, and young, young ladies that we're working with, if they're from African countries, mainly African countries, they will say that they do not or have never spoken about mental health within their household. So if you haven't spoken about mental health in your own household, how are you going to get the courage to go and seek mm -hmm. support where you already think you're going to be judged because you're living with this teeny tiny virus in your, in your, in your body. And women, and women, like you said, I'm a mother too, so it is that whole, no, I don't deserve that, I'll keep it for the children, or things like that, which then leads to burnout and carrying on and just they're not being productive at all. We ran three sets of, um, when we got the funding, it was called self-stigma something, and, and, the, and, and the women refused to be associated with it until we changed it to self-empowerment. Wow. Because they sort of said, we know we self-stigmatize, but what are we going to do about it? It's time that we try to do something yes. about this. Mm -hmm. And during sort of, uh, it was a two-day workshop, uh, unfortunately we had to do it on Zoom, which but it also allowed us to open it up more widely. So we had, like I said, girls joining in from Kenya and Uganda. And we had very honest conversations. At the beginning, people have their cameras off. They don't want to be seen in case so-and-so lives down the road, is also on the call, and then they'll out me, and then, or this or that. But the more we discussed that, you know what, this is what I went through, this is how I found support, this is, 
who mentored me, we slowly started to see cameras coming on, which shows that people are starting to get a lot more confident. And we're grateful that um, Beyond Stigma allowed us pre-release to the Wakakosha song, and I always ended it with, with that, and then would ask the question, what do you take away today? Over 90% would just say that one, Wakakosha. Mm. And it just became something that almost glued us together, but it's still, plays a huge part. There are women that I support that will not even call it HIV. They refuse to even call it HIV. We, we give it different names. I mean, I don't know if there's a George in the house, but one of my mentees calls it George. She calls her mental health Rita. So when she calls me, she's like, George is awake. I think George is awake. I'm like, no, George can't wake up because did you give George his medicine? Yes. So Rita's awake. I'm like, okay, Rita can't wake up because if Rita wakes up, then Gloria's gonna wake up. Gloria is her, when she starts drinking, she says, oh, Gloria's <laughs> awake. So, but we, we had to do this because she would be like on a bus and she's literally breaking down and she needs to talk. And she can't sort of say, oh, I forgot to take my HIV medicine last night. She said, I forgot to give George's medicine. And I think Rita made me. And Gloria was definitely home last night. <laughs> so, so I think it's just finding, meeting people where they are, finding ways of breaking down stigma, taking the time to understand people. And yeah, this whole person-centered, we're all different. We can only be treated in the way that we respond to. Yeah, exactly. With, well, I think Andrea was saying, you know, by being human, you know, by. Be, being hum, human to human, that's, that's really, sometimes it's just not rocket science, is it? It's just not rocket science. Okay, so we are going to open it up to the floor and see if there's any questions um, before I, I have one more question for the panel, but is there, are there any questions? Just maybe, oh yeah, we have a question there, great. Oh yeah. yeah. Thank you. I'm Emmanuel, a Nigerian, but a Ukraine-trained medical doctor, and uh, I just came here during the war. And um, I have a question for Robbie, if I'm sure. Yeah. So um, you did identify the issues with um, vaccination and um, access to medications, especially in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and one of the problems you recognized was the generic um, was not being, um, they, were not give, they were not being licensed to, to, to carry out the generic production of these um, vaccines. Um, do you think engaging with pharmaceutical company on a governmental level, or would that be helpful to um, make these vaccines and these drugs and this medication available for people in that region, aside funding, which is a major issue? That is a fantastic question, and I have a very, very long answer for it, but I'm going to try and keep it short. <laughs> Actually, I'm going to write a little love letter to Ukraine right now. So my PhD is looking at HIV and hepatitis C treatment activism in Ukraine. And the reason why I'm doing it is I went to Kyiv loads of times with my work with European AIDS Treatment Group, and I started making friends with people in 100% Life, uh, Public Health Alliance, um, uh, Ukraine uh, Community Advisory Board, which has a new name anyways. Um, um, I've just fell in love with their activism. And uh, after around 2014, when they started developing these relationships, especially with Minister Supron, um, they use tactics, okay? So there are things we are, can use. There's flexibilities within our intellectual property laws. Now, I'm just talking about HIV treatment here. I can talk about vaccines, which is a little bit more complicated. Um, so we can fight for compulsory licensing, uh, not so much in Ukraine, but that means uh, like patents are in God-given rights. They're what governments reward innovation. And if we have a public health crisis, we can just say, okay, you don't have intellectual property, we're gonna make generics now, okay? So that's one option. However, there's huge international pressure not to do that, so it's a bit tricky. The other thing is you can engage in price negotiations with pharma. A lot of the time, sometimes they listen, a lot of the time they don't. So it's all about uh, um, basically lots of campaigning, campaigning, campaigning. Um, but then you can work with different uh, groups, such as the medicine patent pool. 
Um, so that means voluntary licensing, okay? So it's an amazing initiative set up. Um, Ellen Dehone, who set it up, is a great access to medicines activist too. But basically, this is pharmaceutical industry giving license agreements to generic manufacturers, countries to allow ge generic manufacturing in them. And thanks to HIV activism, that was set up, and that's why uh, low middle income countries have such great access to HIV treatments, including dolutegravir, for example. Now, when we talk about vaccines, it's a little bit more tricky. Um, because uh, mRNA uh, tr uh, technology is a bit new. It's new, so um, pharma companies didn't know how to make them. It's really easy to re-engineer a small molecule or like a um, treatment, but doing a new vaccine is very difficult. So they needed to share the recipe. They needed to share the know-how of how to do this, and they wouldn't. They wouldn't. And a compulsory licensing just gets rid of the, the patent, but we needed a waiver on all intellectual property rights, trade secrets, copyright, and um, so on and so forth. So it's a little bit trickier. We couldn't use the flexibilities in intellectual property law, and that's what our tarnished Yervaka uh, was saying that we need to use. When it was a load of crap, he knew it couldn't work. But yeah, he was saying that's how we're going to do it. So um, with vaccines, there's a lot to do. But I don't think that's going to happen through the benevolence of pharma. That's going to have to happen through uh, legally binding treaties and changing global structures. Because for far too long we have waited for the charities of high income countries and donations or the charity of pharma companies. And that has to change. Very good. Thank you, Robbie. Robbie for president, can I just say? <laughs> that's what I can say. Yeah. No. Michael D forever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Uh, I am conscious that we are running out of time. Okay, so I'm going to ask one more question. From, is, is that okay? Yeah, we're just one more question from the panel. Um, and, and that is a very quick question for all of you to try and get it in as quickly as possible. What can the Irish government do more? Very simple question. It's a quick question. Yeah, yeah, quick question. Quick, quick, quick. All right. uh, Michael, if you might ask you. I thought you were going to tell me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just, just listen to Robbie. Just listen to Robbie. <laughs> That's Robbie's job. Yeah. No, look, I will say we need to put, <clears throat> and we recognize. Global health is not a niche issue. It is at the heart of our development policy, and it's a political issue. We learned, surely we learned that in COVID, but we forget very, very quickly. So we thought we learned it with HIV and AIDS. We thought we learned it with COVID. And Robbie mentioned something very important, and that's the Pandemics Treaty, because in my last job I was in Geneva, and Mike Ryan was a great man in pushing for that treaty. So there now is a process where all of our countries are negotiating for a legally binding treaty mm -hmm. that will make a difference to global health, not just in the rich countries, but globally. So I think what the Irish government can do and will do is really focus on its development work, the centrality of global health, and really make a difference in negotiating the pandemics treaty. Absolutely. Thank you, Michael. What about yourself, Eric? What, what, what would you like to see the Irish government do more of? Um, well, I'll keep it local as well to Ireland, and I would say that, as I mentioned before, HIV means different, uh, means different things to different people, different generations as well, and I believe for the younger generation, they need to be more informed, more educated, but they need to be more involved. You know, the science of U equals U is there, it's plastered everywhere, but people still, they say, sure, but I rather don't. And that's a mistake, it's a statistic, statistical mistake, actually. Um, HIV, people who are positive, undetectable, are safer than somebody who has been tested four months ago and claims to be negative because that means that they are only negative up to six months ago. And if they are having sex with multiple partners and unprotected as well, they are more likely to pass on or to have HIV, to have the virus, than somebody who is, and to pass it on, uh, actually, than somebody like me who are uh, undetectable. But our brain doesn't like probability. That's, that's something that we know how, how our brain works. So what I think the government should do in general lines is to involve young people in the conversation, but not just tell them, ask them. You know, because if we get a bunch of old people like me telling them, and we're like, oh, in the 1990s, you know, we died. And no, they don't want to hear that. It, it's just not appealing to them. It's a different situation in Ireland. It's a different situation nowadays. So get them involved, get them talking, and then get them to pass on the message, whatever message they feel that they want to share. And that's how we're going to get younger people to accept and think about this whole you equals you. Thank you, Eric. And less of the old, because if you're old, I'm old, so let's not just go down there, okay? <laughs> right. Uh, Fungai, what about you? What would you like to see the Irish government do more? I would like the Irish government to speak up very proudly and loudly about the pledge, the Global Fund, and hopefully 
embarrass other rich countries that did not bother to do that, to make them open their pockets and do that because that saves lives globally. And I completely agree with changing the narrative of the way we speak about people living with HIV. Some of the language that is used when talking about people living with HIV is so stigmatizing that it stops people attending centers. So I think if campaigns are supported by the Irish government to make sure that they are talking about people, they're not saying P, uh, parent to child transmission, you know, they're not using that, they're not using, in, you know, very, very old disclosing and things like that. They're using much more softer languages that allows us to come together as one in fighting this, this, this fight that we can win. As you keep saying, this teeny tiny virus. This teeny tiny the little teeny, thing that is in your body that just needs a pill a day. Yes. But we all need access to the pill a day. That's it. <laughs> That's it. Now, because that, that, I, I noticed that in, in your own language that you use, it, it really does kind of break it down. You know, we can do this, you know. Uh, Robbie? Um, I want you to put the song on Spotify. For, that's for first, right? So that's for us. Um, I want the government to do lots of things, but more importantly, I want actually everyone in this room to do things, okay? So our, the pandemic treaty is going, and I'm, I'm harping on quite a, bot, a bit about it, but write your local TDs. Please, 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 they stick to the draft that's out there by the World Health Organization and do not water it down. Make sure that equity is at its heart. That's what we've been doing all month and we're going to continue to do, but it's every single time that TDs hear about the pandemic treaty, it's better, it works, it's for, it's for the global health, basically. And the other thing I'm going to say to the government is continue at all, at all costs, whatever it takes, to continue supporting the Ukrainian uh, people because my heart is broke for all my friends and colleagues in Ukraine and just the amazing work you're doing. So I just want to say uh, that and continue to increase funding into the Global Fund. Thank you, Robbie. And final word to you, Andre. Uh, thank you. Yeah, very briefly, uh, I have uh, three suggestions. One is really with the Global Fund. Uh, it's a huge and very important investment, and uh, we should capitalize on this m more. I think uh, Mara doing an amazing job as a board member uh, at the Global Fund, and uh, it's really important that also uh, funding comes with also policy changes and prioritization. Uh, because what we observe in many countries, we talk about stigma, Prejudice and ideological stereotypes prevails over science. Mm. Like in Russia, for example, where no harm reduction, uh, discrimination of gay men and uh, trans people. So it's one thing. Second, uh, more funding for communities and civil society. We are closest to the ground. Why some governments selecting longer routes, you know? Uh, there are direct ways to channel funding to those the most needed. And finally, well, I'm from Ukraine, so with emergency and crisis, of course, uh, thanks also for flagging this, that we need, of course, some uh, additional emergency support. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andre. So uh, could you please give my, my panelists a very uh, warm uh, applause for Eric, Eric Ogodelo, Michael Gaffey, Robbie Lawler, and of course, Fungai Rao. Thank you so much for sharing your insights with us. And, and speaking of um, our panelist, Robbie, uh, he has a film premiering today. Yeah. Robbie is also a movie star, yeah, right? Not, uh, not just a PhD candidate. Uh, we will now share the trailer with you. Uh, and the, it's called How to Tell a Secret. People diagnosed with HIV talk about the act of disclosure and the relationship between advocacy, stigma, and secrecy that drives many to withhold their HIV status in modern day Ireland. And some will reveal their HIV diagnosis for the very first time on camera. So, so this is the trailer and I believe it's going to be available for the next uh, five uh, days. And it's in the Lighthouse Cinema? I don't know. Okay, Lighthouse, IFI, and all around the country. So. Go see it. I'm in a restaurant off O'Connell Street. I'm the last one he has to meet. He walks in, he sits across from me. He says, this is the worst thing 
you could ever hear from an ex. So many people in Ireland are silent about their status because society has silenced us. Hello there, everybody, and you're all very welcome to another episode of the show. Your semen is dangerous. This is the good news okay. that I've been holding off to now. <laughs> this is the pinnacle of the day. My HIV affects no one. Where's the education skill? It's nowhere. When I tested positive, there was a part of me that just felt like I'd lost something that I would never get back. I ended up promising not to tell anyone, and I kept that promise for a decade. <laughs> Secrets are personal, aren't they? Powerful, too. And in the wrong hands, a secret can become a weapon. So maybe sometimes it's best to keep them to yourself. But sickness, I don't know. That's something different. We don't have to be in a closet anymore. We're going to change this country for the thousands of us living with HIV out there. We're taking a stand. We're stuck in this cycle of shame and silence, and we need to break out of it. One, two, three. Amazing, amazing. And Robbie, you're even prettier on the big screen. You're even prettier on the big screen. Okay, and, <laughs> and there's Veda as well. Wow, we have to go and see that. Okay, so we have come to the end of our amazing, amazing evening. Uh, so before I introduce the choir, uh, thank you for everyone for being here today. Um, of course, the wonderful speakers for sharing your insights and, and your, your wisdom uh, with us because you know, this event, the Father Michael Kelly event and lecture is very much about charging our batteries, you know, because we have a, a year ahead to try and, and get the message across and keep, uh, uh, I suppose, our battle against HIV and, and AIDS um, uh, still high on the international agenda. And even our, in our own lives, how can we raise awareness and make sure that we, we don't let other crises and other things to uh, go, go on the top of the agenda uh, because we have that goal, the 2030 goal that we have to hit. Um, so there will be a reception after this. We, we welcome you to stay uh, for, for, for uh, canopies and wine. And of course, you can also chat to our wonderful panelists. Apologies if you couldn't um, allow for more questions, but we were, we were running uh, behind in time, so we had to shorten the, the, the Q&A. Uh, okay, so as I said, uh, uh, we end the evening thinking of Father Michael Kelly and the incredible legacy he has left in all of us who continue the fight against HIV and AIDS in Ireland and across the world. Uh, let his example of activism, compassion and commitment help us all to leave the world kinder than when we found it. That's, that's all I say to myself and to my kids every day. If you can just leave the world a little bit kinder than when you found it that the world would be a much better place. So again, thank you so much for, for inviting me to, to chair this event. Once again, it's always the uh, highlight of um, the year for me. Thank you, Nadine. Um, and thank you to the, uh, uh, the Global Health um, Fund.